so the uh, spring framework, you know, we we did we managed to make short work of building a service, and then indeed we implementing it in terms of uh, two different persistence technologies. But let's be honest, most people don't write services just for the sake of writing services. They write services, and they write uh, they they write code like what we just wrote, so that they can get access to get access to it uh, from sort of from some sort of user interface, right? After all, if you had to go to an ATM and then manipulate a Java API just to take out money, you'd never ever use it, right? You need an interface. So most people build uh, web applications to meet this requirement today. Most people are using uh, some sort of framework to build that and to expedite that. The servlet API is the standard API for interfacing with web servers, and it provides a clean way to, to it provides a way to manipulate and, and write code in terms of the HTTP you know, API and all that. But it's not really a clean way to build the application that you want to write. So most people use frameworks. And the most popular framework right now is the Spring MVC framework. Spring MVC sits on top of the servlet API <clears throat> and lets you write code, you know, independent of the, the servlet API altogether. If you don't want to know about it, you don't have to. Uh, you can, of course. It's there. It's, you can get access to the full stack. But it's entirely possible to write complete applications without ever even mentioning or acknowledging the fact that you have a servlet in there somewhere, right? Um, and it's also very easy to get started with, right? You just configure it in your web application, and and then you turn it on. So you might use MVC colon annotation driven to turn it on. So let's take a look at, uh, you know, what Spring MVC is at its heart. Generally, uh, and broadly, Spring MVC is what's called a model view controller framework, hence the name. We're we're very good at naming things here at Spring first, just so you know. Uh, the crux of the framework is that requests come into an HTTP endpoint on the server, and they hit a servlet that you registered. This is the dispatcher servlet in the Spring framework. And requests are routed through that dispatcher servlet to Spring Beans, regular Java Pojo-centric uh, Spring Beans in your application context that are called controllers, right? This is just like a component, except it's, you know, it has extra uh, support for mapping and resolving views in a web environment. And that controller has the opportunity to do whatever you want. You know, you can submit the objects, you can submit the request and do some, some, some sort of processing and talk to a backend database. You can talk to another service, which is what we're going to do here. You can, anything you want to do, you can do in this controller class. This is your business logic in the web tier. And then usually the controller forwards any sort of context data, any sort of model data as a result of the operations in the controller back to the front controller, which then forwards that onto a view template, right, or to some sort of viewing mechanism, view, view, view rendering mechanism. You can be anything you want. It can be JSP, it could be velocity, it could be free marker, it doesn't matter. In fact, it could be uh, XML based payloads. And this is, of course, uh, you know, a natural segue into the su great support for, the, for REST in the Spring MVC framework. So you can do anything you want, but it's always going to look basically like this, and, and for good reason. I mean, if you think about it, as we'll see, the, uh, the controller here doesn't have any idea about how the data is going to be used in the view template. And the view template doesn't have any idea of how the data was populated. It doesn't know where and, from, you know, and to what end the data was populated or why. It just knows that it has some data that it has to display. This decoupling of concerns is uh, very valuable. It makes your code more flexible and uh, more maintainable. So. Let's build a. Let's use our service. Let's let's use our the recently built service and actually uh, talk to our customer service from a web application. So again, as before, I built just to reiterate. I built this application, this web application, by going to File, New, Spring Template Project, and then clicking on Spring MVC Project. I'm not gonna, again. I'm not going to do it here, but just so you know, that's what I would have done. So here's my uh, directory. This looks very similar to what we had before, uh, except that it's got an extra folder, which is required by the servlet. You know, it's, it's a directory structure that you need to be able to deploy servlet applications on any container. It doesn't really impact your business code. It's just an extra folder, and there's a particular hierarchy. And that's already pre-configured for you when you use that template. It produces a uh, web.xml file. Which is sort of you know it's very un uninteresting here, and I just wanted to show you that it's un uninteresting. It configures a dispatcher servlet, which is a Spring dispatcher servlet. That's the front controller, right? 
and we've told Spring, we told the dispatcher server that for Spring MVC that we want it to look for any kind of Spring configuration in any of the XML configuration files inside of the webinf forward slash Spring folder, and it's going to find all files that end with that XML. That leads us to this guy here, which is, of course, also, you know, fairly unremarkable. It is, <laughs> it's one, uh, one line to trigger component scanning. You know, this is actually just one line. The rest of it is just schema imports. And that component scanning is what tells Spring to look for components with annotations in the, in the package. If you're uh, sort of unfamiliar with XML and would prefer just to drag and drool, that's, you have that option as well. The Spring Source Tool Suite provides a great smarts for configuring this kind of stuff. So here you can see I've actually got uh, the ability to declaratively click on and click off in namespaces and add them to my context. Once I have a namespace enabled, I can then do auto completion just like anything else, right? And that's it knows about the Spring Framework uh, support and knows about the different APIs and so on. So one 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 uh, one more line down is the actual MVC colon annotation driven. This is what actually tells Spring to also look for controller objects in these packages, not just regular components, but also uh, web tier components, right? Components that are based on Spring MVC. So again, not not a not too much to write home about here. It's just a sort of bootstrap configuration. And this is, again, something you'll probably write once in, in an application and, and never look at it again, right? There's nothing there to, to worry about. <clears throat> so the effect of what we just saw was that it's going to scan our Java packages and load the objects. And of course, we want it to load our business logic for servicing the web user interface, right? And in Spring MVC, to do that, to handle that, you build controllers. A controller uh, is a Spring object, just like any other object that we've seen, and it benefits from all the services and all the you know goodies that we've already established. So you can see right off the bat, the first thing I'm doing is I'm injecting a reference to our JPA-based customer service, and I'm using at AutoWire to get access to that. So I'm you know I'm already you know ahead of the game. I don't have to worry about how to get that reference. I can just inject it. I'm making the library itself available to this web application by using the Maven uh, project configuration. And when Maven and the Spring Source Tool Suite sees that I've got a reference to the JPA service in my web application, it automatically provides a reference to the source code, the, you know, the sister project. So I can actually you know, get the latest version of that code. If I make any changes over here, you'll see it here. Um, anyway, back to this controller. The controller here uh, has a reference to the injected custom service. And it has a controller annotation. This is exactly like at component. It's just a slightly bit more specialized, and it tells Spring that this is a uh, Spring MVC component, right? And that it should also be checked for other annotations that might be used to map requests to the controllers in the in the application. So the at request mapping annotation tells Spring that this class is going to handle all requests for root. Uh, for the root application forward slash customer. It'll then scan the methods in the class itself and look for more specific mappings. So for example, say we want to handle both forward slash customer as well as only methods that have the HTTP verb get. We can, we can do that. Can, we can configure that here. You don't need to do it this way. You can have, you, indeed, you could have a request mapping on the method itself, or you could have it you know, split apart like this as, as well. This Configuration implies that you might have different methods for different types of verbs, all for customer or you know any number of combinations there, all in the same class. I'm just doing one method, one you know handler here, just because that's the only use case I've got. You can see that the method itself is uh, very simple, and indeed the whole class is very simple. There's no servlet code here at all. This is just a Java POJO, and we've annotated it to tell Spring the extra information it needs to know to be able to map this object to an HTTP URL endpoint. So when somebody invokes our web application and hits forward slash customer, they're going to hit this method with an HTTP GET request, which is the kind of request you make when you just hit, enter the browser. And Spring is going to look for a request attribute, a request, request parameter named ID. And you can tell it that I want that ID to be passed into my method invocation as a parameter. And I want it to be of type long, right? So I don't need to 
worry about converting it or anything like that. It just works, and if there's an exception, if there's any trouble, you'll get a validation error, which you can handle and display back to the user. And then from there, I make sure it works of the actual processing, right? All I want to do is get access to my customer data. So I pass in the ID, and get a custom object, and use that to fuel uh, a model, which in, the, in this case is just a map, a key value association pair. The customer key will be used to drive the generation of the view, which in this case is a template. Spring, the Spring MVC framework will look up that view by convention. It'll look up the method name, and then it'll follow some sort of configured heuristic to actually resolve that to a view template. Uh, in this case, I've overridden the heuristic that it's using to look up the view template by configuring an alternative. You don't have to do this, but I'm just showing you that the entire stack is completely pluggable and tailorable. The defaults are great, and indeed, you've already seen how simple this code is. There's no, there's two classes, and one of them is optional. <laughs> so uh, let's look at the configuration now. This is, a, again, Java-based configuration, and it's picked up automatically when the, uh, when the application is started. You don't need it. You know, I'm only doing this to show you how you can tailor certain parts of it. In particular, I want to tailor how Spring MVC resolves my templates. So I wanted to take the view name, which it gets by the method, which so the view name here is customer. I wanted to take the view name and then prefix it with webinf forward slash views and then suffix it with .jsp. So the view template path will be webinf forward slash views forward slash customer .jsp. We, when this being gets registered with the context, Spring MVC Spring picks it up and automatically registers that as the override, right? So let's actually look at our view template, which is lives over here, exactly where we configured it to be. And the view template's, uh, if I'm honest, pretty unremarkable as well. I'm not really the best designer in the world. I'm not going to lie. It's a, it's a very plain pedestrian table here. All we're doing is printing out the first name and last name information based on the customer key, right? Remember that request that came in? Remember that model data that we set up? It's now available in our view template. We're using a JSP here, but as I said, you could use velocity, you could use anything. Um, and so that's it. We've got a working application, and it goes from end to end with you know, one JSP file and really effectively only one class. You don't need that configuration class. It was just sort of a, a grab bag, you know, an extra bit of information. Let's actually deploy it, right? The, the Spring Source Tool Suite provides great support for numerous different uh, uh, servers. The Spring Source Tool Suite ships out of the box with the TC Server Developer Edition, which we're going to use uh, for our examples. But you can also use any of the light, any of the uh, lightweight uh, application. Uh, sorry, any of the lightweight containers that we talked about earlier, including Tomcat and Jetty and so on. And of course, you can deploy it to the cloud. There's various connectors for the cloud environments. Uh, and of course, there's also connectors for, uh, you know, traditional application servers. So you can use all those as well. We're we're using the one that comes out of the box because it happens to be a very good aid for development, right? I've already got it running, so I'm not going to deploy it. But if you wanted to deploy it, you could just click on this and then drag it onto the container to the server here, and then hit start. I've got it running in the background here. You know, already preloaded, so you can see it's. Hitting our, this is a URL, it's hitting our web application, Spring Service Web, hitting our endpoint, which is customer, and then the ID is the parameter that we are passing in, right? This is hitting a data source that I've got running in the background, which is this database. You know, again, two rows, not very interesting, one and two. So right now we're looking at John Appleseed, row number one. Change that, row number two, right? Very, very uh, pedestrian, but you, get, you understand the idea.